led by uh, uh, by John Fresco. So let me um, let me go ahead and and introduce uh, John uh, while uh, while the panelists' uh, videos are being pinned up uh, uh, to the to the screen. Um, okay, so um, um, so John is. Um, uh, you know, I, I think John really needs no introduction to this, this audience. Um, he's um, he's uh, the Feynman Professor of uh, Theoretical Physics at, at Caltech. He is the director of the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter. He's also the science coordinator for this QSA uh, uh, Institute that I, that I spoke of. Um, you know, in, term, in terms of uh, uh, quantum computing, uh, he's... he's uh, uh, he's a towering figure who has been extraordinarily uh, influential in quantum computing, both through his um, his instinct for knowing what are the important questions, as well as through his mentoring of this vast fraction of students and postdocs uh, in the field. So, um, so uh, really great to uh, to welcome John and. Uh, um, I, 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 I let's, let's see. Uh, I'd like to see if. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I was still sharing the screen. Is it possible to to pin the the videos at this point? All right, our panelists are uh, appearing. All right, well, thanks very much, Umesh. Uh, welcome everybody to Quantum Industry Day, to the first of two panel discussions. As Umesh mentioned, I'm a professor of theoretical physics at Caltech. I'm also an Amazon scholar associated with the Center for Quantum Computing that Amazon has established uh, on the Caltech campus. I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. We have seven very interesting people representing seven companies. Um, Mike Biersuk is the founder and CEO of Q Control and also professor of quantum physics and quantum technology at the University of Sydney. He, his company uh, develops control solutions in both hardware and software for quantum technology and he continues to operate his research group at the university. Jay Gambetta is the IBM fellow and vice president for quantum computing at IBM. Uh, he's been at IBM for 10 years now, leading developments in superconducting quantum computing. Nate Gamelke is the CTO and director of technology at QERA. Uh, before that, he was on the faculty of Penn State. Uh, QERA is developing a technology of Rydberg atoms in tweezer arrays. Jordanus Karanidis is the head of quantum algorithms at QCWare and also the director of the Paris Center for Quantum Computing. Jordanus has made many contributions to quantum algorithms and he's been especially active recently in pursuing the potential applications of quantum machine learning. Terry Rudolph is the co-founder of SciQuantum and professor of quantum physics at Imperial College London. SciQuantum is developing silicon photonics for quantum computing. Steve Sanders is the director of engineering for Honeywell Quantum Solutions. He's been at Honeywell for over 20 years working on a variety of engineering challenges and has been part of Honeywell's quantum effort for about five years now. And is Matthias here? Um, not sure he's joined us yet, but uh, Matthias Troyer, uh, who I hope will be joining us, is uh, a distinguished scientist at Microsoft. Uh, until 2019, he was professor of computational physics at ETH. He's an expert on classical and quantum algorithms for simulating quantum matter. So I'd like to start with Jay. Um, Jay, Already 15 years ago, you were working on transmons in superconducting quantum computing back in your Yale days. And transmons have advanced a lot uh, since then, thanks in part to innovations at IBM. 
Are we starting to see those advances slow down in your opinion? Do you see signs that the improvements in fidelity for uh, transmons are in multi-qubit devices in particular are reaching limits? Is it time to start thinking about alternative approaches to superconducting qubit design in your opinion? Uh, thanks, John. Um, so I'll, I'll partially answer it uh, positive and negative in, in, in both ways. Um, the transmon is the most simplest superconducting qubit you can make a uh, junction with capacitor. Uh, recently, we've seen uh, still continued improvements with us uh, getting near a millisecond in coherence, right? And you'll see, uh, you'll see that emerging into our larger devices in the next couple of weeks. So if I look at it and I try and compare the gate fidelities or the coherence, no, it hasn't sl started slowing down. So we still think that we'll continue pushing, uh, pushing those limits and keep pushing them well into the tens of milliseconds and the error rates are small enough. But on the other side, I totally support high risk, high reward type research and looking at alternate alternative qubits in the university lab. And especially if they're done in a way where we could imagine putting them inside a larger device that we make. But as far as IBM is concerned for the time being, you're gonna ride the same horse, the transmon for some while yet. And expect to continue to see improvements in performance and- uh, If you, are, if you yeah. want to study coherence, you wanna build the simplest thing you can do to it. Mm -hmm. And the simplest thing you can do is a capacitor and a junction. Mm -hmm. And when you can get the cues of that even higher than the cues of resonators, um, there is no reason to stop pursuing that direction um, whilst you keep pushing up the quality. Now, if things come in that can give us a much more efficiently, I would totally put it in, but it is a myth to think that the coherence of transmons is less than others. Okay, that's very encouraging. And uh, along the lines of uh, where we're heading in hardware development, uh, I have a question for Steve. Uh, Honeywell made an uh, architectural decision a few years <coughs> back about what type of ion trap uh, design to pursue, which is a bit different than some other groups and companies have decided. Uh, you are building microfabricated traps with multiple operating zones and moving the ions around between those zones. So what, what drove that decision and how far do you think that can carry us? Yes, good question. Well, uh, when we began this, and uh, thank you, John, and hello to everybody. Um, well, when we began this exercise five years ago, uh, we certainly believe that some of our strengths were our microfabrication capabilities. And we believe that trapped ions would need to take advantage of those. Um, could start with you know, large chains of ions in single wells, but uh, we believe that there were some pretty um, restrictive limitations that you could achieve with that and believe that we could overcome any of those with, with these microfabricated traps. Um, Today, I think the evidence is pretty good. I mean, we have our two commercial systems online today with 10 qubits and a volume, of, a quantum volume of, of 10 qubits, two to the 10. Um, well, that approach gives you very good gate fidelity. We're running typically in the 997, 998 range, very low crosstalk, uh, which in turn enables things like mid-circuit measurement and has enabled us to do some nice things with quantum error correction demos recently at least demonstrating all of the functional steps needed to do a logical qubit. Um, you know, qubit reuse, uh, which allows you to reduce the number of qubits you need and so forth. So we thought there were a number of important advantages that that would offer and uh, wanted to start tackling those challenges right away. Um, one of those challenges, for example, is to go to two-dimensional traps um, or our current commercial systems are based on one-dimensional geometries. We do now have two-dimensional traps um, working, uh, moving ions through junctions, moving even mixed species ions through junctions. Um, so, uh, so we think there's a, there's a lot of runway there, um, certainly even to into the thousands of, of physical qubits kind of range. Um, so of course we're keeping our eyes on, on other approaches like uh, you know, photonic links, but um, we think this approach has a lot of runway still. There seems to be a trade-off between that high fidelity uh, entangling gate you've achieved and the speed of the gates. Your gates are pretty slow. 
do you think uh, at some point we're going to care enough about uh, how long it takes to get to solution in a quantum algorithm that we'll have to have much faster ion trap gates? Certainly that's important. The depth one circuit time is, uh, is a little long for us uh, and we continue to push on that. Turns out we're really not limited by the gate time itself. We're actually limited by things like uh, once you do the ion transport, um, we want to cool them back down, for example. And so uh, we have a lot of work going on fast and cool ion transport. How do you keep it cool even while you're moving it quickly? And then how do you cool it down again quickly if it does heat up a little bit? Um, faster gates, um, faster transport. So all of those things continue to be uh, you know, big priorities. And I think, again, we have, we have um, I think we can probably get quite a bit of improvement in the next couple of years, actually. All right, so continuing with our uh, hardware builders. Uh, Nate, we've seen some impressive results lately from these uh, Rydberg systems in simulating novel states of matter and both in equilibrium and far from equilibrium. Uh, does QERA envision uh, a gate-based, a circuit-based approach with the technology? Or do you think that uh, potential customers are going to find value in, the, in that type of uh, quantum simulation platform? Yeah, so, so the answer is yes, uh, yes to both. Um, so we are pursuing both pathways. Uh, you know, I think in the near term, neutral atoms have a, a good advantage in terms of just being able to scale the systems to very large size. And that means that we can attack problems that are, you know, certainly above the threshold where, where we can classically simulate what these machines will do. So, you know, we feel that the quantum simulators are, are really kind of a unique opportunity in the near term. Um, there's a lot of scientific computing goals that, that we think that we can tackle, you know, basically out of the gate with those machines. You know, one of, one of the big challenges is how do you expose the utility of that to people broadly and, you know, encourage application development in a space that it really requires to, to put a very high intellectual uh, thinking cap on and try to figure out how to map systems onto each other. So from that sense, you know, programmable quantum simulators with, with the programmability that's increasing over time, that's a great pathway for making sure that we're always doing something which is unique, um, but also gets us into that range where we can start to one day do universal gate-based computing, think about error correction, those kinds of things. Um, so you, I think you'll see in the next year, um, a lot of results, not, not just out of the academic community, but also out of Cura and the other uh, neutral atom companies, uh, pushing that, that programmability up, uh, getting gate addressing and really thinking about it in the traditional quantum computing context. But at the same time, I think you'll, you'll see a storm of, of new results on, on simulation scientific computing. You expressed optimism about scaling things up. Uh, do you see uh, you know, uh, an obstacle in the short term to how big a tweezer platform you can build and operate? I mean, you know, it's, it's, to some extent, it's a question of how big a machine we project is gonna be useful in the near term. Um, so, you know, Obviously, cold atom systems can build quantum systems that are, are strongly coherent and have, have qubit numbers or, or atomic uh, numbers that are in the tens of thousands if we want to. Um, quantum simulators may, have, have made a lot of progress in that regard. Uh, quantum gas microscopes and, and machines that look like that. But for quantum computation, you know, obviously, you want to keep that system entangled over large sizes. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to really, you know, kind of build a machine that's that's much bigger than that. So we're kind of staying at that threshold. Uh, you know, we're, we're taking a, a broader view about how to define, you know, the entanglable uh, a sample of the quantum computer. Um, so, you know, ideas like quantum volume are useful, but uh, when when you have multi-qubit gates to exploit, uh, it's, it can be a little bit wider thinking about how big that computer should be. So for now, we've picked... Uh, uh, qubit sizes of a couple hundred for that reason, and we'll stay ahead of, of where coherence permits us to, to go. Okay, I'm going to Terry. Uh, Terry, if I'm not mistaken, you have at times expressed some skepticism about the prospects for scaling some of the platforms and have advocated uh, photonics as the best approach. So can you explain your reasons for that skepticism? as well as why you think photonics is a more promising avenue? <laughs> That's really putting me on the spot. I didn't realize I get that question. No, I, okay. Take a long time to go through each different architecture and discuss, you know, there's, there are very good reasons to pursue as many architectures as we can, I think. 
but if you're very focused on full fault tolerant quantum computing getting to the order of 10 to the 10 gates on hundreds of logical qubits i don't really see another option um with the photonics you know because the challenge is kind of inverted that the you know the scaling part of what we do is very easy by comparison to just the production of a small entangled state that you know i'm pretty optimistic uh about the the sort of scaling part and yeah the hard part for us is producing something like a 10 to 20 qubit entangled state on a reasonable repetition rate like you know a few hundred megahertz or gigahertz or something like that and you know the rest of it's it's easy by by comparison to other challenges in the field um and so you know we we've gone with what we think will get us to a machine that is provably useful and I, you know, one day I do think things like how many Toffley gates you can do in a day and other sort of metrics for comparing different approaches to doing quantum computing will be relevant. And, you know, in, in those kinds of things, photonics also comes off pretty well if you do a comparison. And so, you know, even if the very first quantum computer isn't photonic, I'm pretty sure the ones in 50 years time will be so I don't feel I'm wasting my time out of academia at the moment. We've been eagerly awaiting uh, news about uh, PsyQ's success at uh, you know, creating <laughs> entangled photon states. Are we going to be hearing some good news soon? Um, I guess it depends, you know, as I said, everything's a little bit different, right? Like we produce well, let's just say many billions of, of photons a second, and they're very easily entangleable by putting them on a beam splitter. So, you know, if we came up with a metric that that was, uh, you know, good for our architecture would be something like how much entanglement in a space-time volume are you producing? And yeah, you know, we can create a lot, but it's just not, our focus is really on fault tolerance and not just generic entanglement creation. And creating fault tolerance entanglement, as you know, is a, is a different ball game, right? You've got to be smart. Um, you've got to have uh, yeah, just different uh, parameter regions of control. And so because the quantum part of what we do is kind of trivial compared to the sort of classical part of what we do, I don't think it's uh, particularly useful for us to bang on about the quantum stuff where people will be like, yeah, well, that's easy for you guys. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. Some of these are are down to just you know what's your your sort of personal taste and how you should uh, communicate progress. But I, you know, I think we've chosen a particular path that that people have some pretty good understanding of what we're doing. I think. All right. Well, like control is a good segue to Mike. Uh, Q control is developing hardware agnostic control solutions. Can you explain to us why it makes sense to uh, address the control problem in a platform independent way rather than customizing it to uh, each hardware approach? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess to start, uh, we, do, we do both, right? So we build tools that at their core are hardware agnostic. Um, it, it effectively starts with some Hamiltonian level model of your system or uh, the absence of a Hamiltonian level model um, where all you're doing is representing controllable variables in your system, whatever knobs they might be, whether they're the, you know, electrical currents in uh, in thermal tuning for phase shifters in a photonic circuit, or they're the IQ modulation signals in a superconducting circuit. Ultimately, it's a knob we can turn. What we try to build is solutions that uh, allow you to do robust quantum logic and build autonomy and um, uh, uh, use AI and machine learning techniques in order to automate uh, a lot of the low-level control tasks that are required for these systems like tune-up and the like. Now, all the tools at their heart are agnostic. And, and I think the motivation for that is illustrated by the diversity of opinions we see today on what is the best pathway forward. But what we always do is, uh, you know, to use a software analogy, we skin the solutions, like you can start with Android on a mobile phone and then make the Samsung skin or whatever, in order to suit the dominant needs of a particular platform. So for instance, we'll take our tools and we have very specific solutions that we've deployed on IBM's hardware. 
for using, say, um, deep reinforcement learning to design the IQ modulation waveforms that give you uh, error robust quantum logic gates that only need to be retuned once a month instead of once a day. Um, and we have similar different approaches for Malmer Sorensen gates in trapped ions and the like. But for us, the motivation is very much that starting today in the era of small scale systems and looking forward, through to full fault tolerant machines. We see that in, in, in every step and in every platform, there's an essential need for control and automation. And uh, that's the, the key problem that we're trying to, uh, to address across all the different platforms. So some of the companies are developing the full stack, but, but you have uh, decided to occupy a niche uh, but tying into some of those bigger companies. So do you think there are other such uh, you know, areas where a company can uh, map out some territory and contribute to the advance of the field, but without uh, building the full stack? Yeah, I mean, I think um, my, my personal view, having now become the, the you know, gone from physicist to uh, CEO of a software company, or, or dominantly software company, is, uh, is that there's a lot to learn from the software industry where broadly coders, software engineers do as much as they can to avoid writing code and instead focus on bringing in third-party solutions or existing solutions as much as, as you possibly can for efficiency. And um, I, I think the, the notion of companies insisting on being full stack and, and meaning that they do that to the exclusion of all other things, I think that will gradually uh, melt away. Now, we already see a diversity of players. I mean, uh, QCWare is is one such organization that focuses at the top of the stack, you know, application layer. Uh, our friends at Zapata and, uh, and OneCubit do similar things. Uh, and I think you'll see more and more uh, opportunity for solutions from the application layer and the operating systems down through the kinds of infrastructure software that, uh, that we focus on where we're, we're closer to the hardware. Uh, but I, I do think ultimately the stack will evolve to have multiple players across many of the different platforms. All right. So having mentioned QCWare, let's, let's hear from your uh, You have, I, I have heard you say, and actually I've quoted you from time to time, as saying quantum machine learning is overhyped but underestimated, uh, a pleasing uh, oxymoron. Can you explain that both sides of it? Uh, how is it overhyped and also underestimated? Yeah, I, I guess you pay too much attention to what I say, <laughs> but let's see. Um, I think what's happening is is you know something that when you try to bridge the gap between basic research on one side and very on one side and very you know. Uh, applications and real world problems on the other side, then it's it's not very easy in the sense that in order to make something actually work in the real world, you have to obviously start with some solid theoretical you know, idea and some solid algorithm, but then you have to do many things to, to take this theoretically beautiful algorithm and make it work on, on in real life, right? So to do that, you may lose some of you know, the beautiful theorems that you can prove about what this algorithm can actually do, right? Because you have to, to tweak it to make it work in practice. And this may not always be, you know, uh, let's say it's, it can be frowned upon at some point, right? Because you're losing this, this mathematical background, that the, the solid background that you have. And this is when I say that it can be, you know, uh, Underestimated from the point of view that in a, you know it, you may not be able to prove anything, but as long as you have some, you start from something solid and you try to build intuition and you try to make it work in practice, then this might actually work, right? And overestimated in the sense that if you don't really have to prove something, which is many times the case in machine learning, then you can also claim many things that may not be based on solid, you know evidence, let's say, or mathematical proofs. So somehow it's, it's what I'm trying to do in the last few years is kind of try to balance the two, the two things, right? And try to bridge the, the more theoretical work that I, I was doing in academia for the last 20 years. And the fact that 
you know, I wanted to ask a very specific question, which was, how can we make these machines useful? Right. So, you know, and it's in this kind of balance between the two that I think that we really need to make an effort and figure out how to make things work. Well, I'm wondering how delicate that balance is. You, like some of our other uh, panelists, are, maintain a foot in academia as well as in the quantum industry. Is, is that a stable situation? Uh, <laughs> is there some tension between the two, between your academic and, uh, mm -hmm. and business hats? Uh, or do, do, are there pressures that will no. tilt you one way or the other? It's a question, I guess, that also applies to others in the panel. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, the decision to, to try out to, to, to also work in, with a startup and not solely uh, at the university was, was a question of, you know, what do I need in order to say that at least I made my best effort to actually figure out if, for example, these disk machines or the fault tolerance machines can actually have useful applications, right? So what I needed was like one, make sure that I'm working in the right problems, that the problems that people actually want to solve, right? And for that, you need to have connection with the industry and figure out what are really the problems that people solve and they cannot solve or they would like to solve, right? The second is that, you know, especially in this period where the machines are extremely, you know, difficult to, to use and noisy, you need to have access to the hardware to test things out. So I also needed to have access to the hardware and actually to many different hardware because all of them have different, you know, pros and cons, let's say. And the third is that you also want to be in a research oriented environment, right? So kind of how do you combine all these things? Well, in my, on my side, I went to a small startup that does quantum algorithms as a priority, right? So we are research oriented. We try to find algorithms, but we can try to connect it to, to, to problems that people want to solve in practice. So in that sense, I don't see a big difference between academia and, and, and being in a, in a quantum company. I think, you know, there, as long as you have the right environment, you can do your work and continue and make the best you can. You can be a professor three days a week and a businessman three days a week and rest <laughs> on Sunday and everything works out. You get, you get away with many things because you also have the academic thing, right? Like you have to talk to VC people less because you say, no, no, I cannot do these things. I've never learned, you know? So it's, you know, it gives you a, a bit of a license to, to, to be a little different than a business person. Right? So that's good. Well, you made the good point that you want to talk to real customers to find out what the problems are that they want to solve. But that connects to kind of a broader question, which is uh, some of the both uh, algorithms of people and, and hardware builders have customers and uh, which are using their services. Why? Uh, what, um, you know, what is really incentivizing them uh, if, as as far as we can tell, is currently the case, they can't really yet with existing platforms solve problems that uh, they care about and that they couldn't solve using, uh, using classical computers. Um, well, maybe it's a good question for Jay. You've got lots and lots of customers clamoring to use your, uh, use your hardware. Uh, why don't they just wait until you have a more powerful quantum computer that can really solve their problems? It's a good question. Um, honestly, I think I see this as tools and we're building tools that have more capability. A lot of our customers go everywhere from education places. Um, uh, so in academic research, um, like Michael, for example, is looking at different types of controls as many doing that. So they get value out of using these tools and exploring. And then a lot of businesses, um, they want to start their quantum journey now. They don't want to wait. And so they want to get in early. They want to learn how these tools work and they want to see where it's going and get an understanding of it. And we, um, our view is to be transparent of where the technology is, but release an aggressive roadmap of where we're going and, and allow them to come along on this journey with us. And many appreciate that. So, but in a way you're pulled in two directions, right? Because you want to uh, provide service for your customers, but you also want to make the big 
innovations that will, uh, you know, pay off big time down the road. Are, are those things in tension with one another or do you see them as synergistic? We've uh, designed our way of operating um, to keep them in synergy. Like we have things that we call core, core devices, which we put work into making them uh, reliable, stable, up and learning all the details of that. And then we have a way of making what we call exploratory devices, uh, be it we introduce fast reset um, in our last, one of our last ones um, uh, that allowed us to not have any loss in uh, coherence uh, to be able to tool. So we deployed it straight away. Um, we're, we're going to deploy 127 qubits um, in next, next month. And so you'll see um, those come online and they're a good learning for us um, to see how they work. And uh, so we, we keep them going both and with transparency to the user and the clients, uh, there isn't the ten, uh, tension because uh, our team also wants to use our exploratory devices to do their research. Do any of you want to venture but an opinion? I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, I, I think that our perspective on customers is, is a bit different in the sense that we don't really see ourselves as building a quantum computer, which we will then open up to customers to use per se. You know, we, we do engage with customers, but we imagine, you know, we're going to be a quantum company with a quantum computer. We want to solve problems that we think are important and generate value for our shareholders, you know, solving, generating IP and solving things that we think are societally important. And that's a big motivator for a lot of the engineers in our company that, that they, you know, they're not just building a computer that's kind of much of much this is people are from the silicon industry but they're doing something that they think uh, you know working on the right sorts of problems they can really change the world and that's a good motivation it's certainly one of my motivations you know to go the thing life was a lot simpler back in academia than it is here and uh, you know but i think you know we have an obligation if, if we think we can do this we should be doing it i think so you want to go big motivation with business model we of course have the same motivation but your path to get there depends on it. Well, how long is that path? Do any of you have uh, an opinion uh, you're willing to share about uh, how far the world is from a commercially relevant quantum computer? I don't mean in the sense that customers will pay to use it because that's happening now, but one which will actually solve problems of considerable value in business that can't be solved by other means. Is it still a long road to go? I, I think I'm still enough of a scientist to say that that's an open question. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we have hypotheses about how they get used. Um, that, that's already pretty good. Uh, being able to predict when, when that performance is going to come. I, you know, I, I, I think we need to do the experiment to, to build out the business and get the customers in the door, see how they're using it, react to that, and, and drive it home. Um, and that's that's likely to be a, a long road, but who knows? Maybe we'll find it's it's right around the corner because we didn't think about the right idea before we built these things. And it's going to be a fun journey, to be honest. It's going to be fun. I guess that's why we're all doing it, right? Everybody having fun? Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, as an algorithms guy, uh, Jordan, do you... Uh, do you see promise in so-called uh, noisy intermediate scale? quantum technology are we going to be able to uh, solve interesting problems with it in your opinion yeah another one of these uh, open questions i guess i think what is important is is to to make sure that we kind of try our best to make them you know to make something useful out of these machines because these are the machines that we have and we're going to have for some time so to me the question is how can we make the best effort to make them useful, right? If we actually manage to do it in the end, that's okay, we will see, right? Of course, it's not a wasted, as we said, the journey is not wasted. Like making an algorithm work from a million qubits with to a thousand qubits is also very useful even if you have fault tolerant qubits, right? Because we're not gonna have millions fault tolerant qubits from, from the get-go either. So try to, to close the timeline, whether it is on the NISCARA or for the fault tolerant computer, I think it's it's very important. If we manage from the algorithmic side to 
to come up with new algorithms that can deal better with noise or that can use fewer qubits or more shallow circuits and things like that, this really advances the timeline to, to useful stuff for, with a lot. And I'm willing to do the best I can because as Terry said, I think, yeah, we have a responsibility to, to try our best. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, we hear a lot about the need to develop a quantum workforce people who are trained to enter this field um, for which there is an increasing appetite. Uh, is that a challenge for your companies now? Do you have trouble finding the people that you need to fill roles uh, in your companies? And, and what kind of training do you wanna see that will uh, fit your needs? You, you have an opinion, Steve? I do, it certainly is a challenge. Um... I think for you know one one good way to see that is if you look at the Oak Ridge uh, newsletter every Sunday it comes out you see about 150 roles posted for quantum scientists quantum engineers and you know the the, the seven of us on phone and maybe three or four other places are all in competition <laughs> you know to fill those same 150 roles um, so it's certainly a challenge you know, we look for atomic physicists the good news is we're located in Boulder Colorado where there's a pretty good supply of those. But um, right now, finding electrical engineers, photonics people, uh, they're all in, in high demand and short supply. And, uh, you know, we, we could certainly use more of all of those. I think, um, you know, very broadly, a lot of the general skills are in extremely high demand. And that means that everybody in, on this call would be a, at some level competing for the same class of people. I mean, our particular strategy focused on building really niche capability in quantum control engineering. And so we compete for a slightly different market. Um, but maybe to your, to your second point, John, um, what is it that we're looking for? Um, you, you know, I had, I had written about this. You and I talked about this briefly uh, some months ago. Um, I think the thing we're looking for most is people with experience and research. And um, I say that to contrast with a growing trend that I see in the in the you know education workforce development that really talks about well we're just going to make a, a master's program that is so ideally suited for the quantum industry and everybody will flow through that um, and and there are certainly cases in which that may be appropriate like some of them like the the Etaha one is really fantastic for people who want to work in superconducting qubits um, and there are similar examples around the world. Um, I think broadly, what we find most attractive in good candidates is a demonstrated ability to do deep research. And that's not, you know, a one semester project that's, that's doing two years of at, at least masters or, or more of uh, really exploratory research because it's their creativity that we find most valuable. And then the rest of it, I think we can, we can teach on the job. If you're not familiar with, I don't know. TensorFlow, you can learn that. If you're not familiar with some particular tenet of robust control theory, you can learn that. But if you don't have experience in solving hard problems and understanding what it takes to, uh, to overcome some of the real challenges we face in the laboratory, that, that's something that's very difficult to teach on the job. Hi, this, being the, oh, this being the, uh, the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing, I presume a lot of our viewers are theorists. Anybody want to hire theorists? Looking for those two. All right, that's that's good to see. I guess uh, we're kind of getting to the end of our scheduled time. We should probably give the audience uh, a chance. Can we uh, push a few minutes uh, further, Umesh, before we wind up? Uh, yes, uh, let's let's do that. Um, what what we have after this is a break on gather time. So let's let's cut into this. And uh, actually, let me also say that uh, we have a moderator. Um, uh, who is who is checking the the chat and the Q and A? Uh, so if anybody from the audience has questions, please please post it on that. So our moderator is um, is Andrea uh, Colodangelo. He's he's a postdoc at the Simons Institute. So so he'll be looking through through these questions and asking you to unmute and and uh, ask your questions. Before we go to the audience, just one more thing. Just does anybody want to make a prediction about where we will be, say, 10 years from now? How do you anticipate the evolution of the industry? 
That's a good one for you, Jay. Uh, I think I've been pretty, pretty vocal of where I see uh, what we're going to do over the next few years. We tend to underestimate uh, in the future and overestimate um, how hard things are in here. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. I always am. So I'm hoping we're at the stage where we have large scale uh, machines that are using error correction. And Terry. I, I was just going to say, I think that the history of classical computing told us that until we had a classical computer in hand, you know, you had Turing doing stuff on piece of paper without the actual device, we wouldn't have Pokemon and Minecraft. Turing was not going to come up with, you know, important applications like that, was he? So until we really have quantum computers in hand, I think we, we actually don't really know what their impact will be because so much of algorithm development has to be heuristic and tested out and, you know, is this thing converging or not? That's how the real classical world of algorithms works. And so in 10 years time, I'm really hoping that we're in that world where we can't really judge what their impact is because we don't have them to play with and, and, and really, you know, run algorithms that, you know, proper large scale algorithms with. And so, yeah, it's exciting, but uh, I think it'd be very naive to really predict what, what that will involve. I wanted to add just that, uh, uh, I'm extremely optimistic about the shape of the industry in part because of the level of, end user engagement of people who want to build and uh, want to use quantum computers as much as uh, those of us on the call like to, to build and optimize them. Uh, and, and to me, the best evidence for that actually has come through COVID. Um, when, when things started looking pretty bad in, in March, April, 2020, um, many, many people predicted another uh, call for the quantum winner. We've had a lot of calls for quantum winners. Um, one motivation could have been that enterprise was paying out of corporate responsibility budgets or exploratory research budgets, and that would just dry up and that would be the end of it as soon as there was a risky economic environment. And that simply did not materialize, right? We've seen a doubling and tripling down of end user engagement in the field. And I think that portends uh, you know, ongoing growth that's gonna support the technical developments that everybody on this call is uh, working so hard on. Well, John, I'm, I'm glad that you picked 10 years uh, because I think we could come back in 10 years and have the same panel reassembled. Uh, and, and I think that we'll all survive that. And I think that we probably will all be doing the same thing, uh, quantum computing. But I hope that we will be speaking a language um, that you know, we'll, we'll recognize parts of it today, uh, but there'll be you know, new words in that lexicon that we discovered by making these, these machines big enough that we have to study how they work. And you know, I think that's where real algorithms uh, discovery is going to start. Is once once that machine is really a, a studyable beast, and it's it's a, almost a, a fundamental science of itself. And I, I think that's a great place to come back to the Simons Institute ten years later and, and see how it's how it's gone. All right, it's a date. Uh, I expect you all in ten years. I'm glad that none of you are anticipating that the field will crash and burn in that uh, time interval. I see one I'm question. I'm hoping Microsoft Exchange doesn't survive 10 years, so don't send me a calendar invite. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> let's, let's go the old way. I see one question in the chat. It's kind of a technical one uh, for Nate. Uh, I'll paraphrase. It's about to what extent, uh, you know, should we be concerned about spontaneous emission as a fundamental limit on, uh, on Rydberg platforms? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, it, definitely, it's 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 in the air budget. Um, it's it's something that we think about a lot. It really depends on how how you're running your quantum computer. So uh, there there are two different kinds of spontaneous emission uh, that we worry about. One is from the excited state in the Rydberg state. Uh, we also excite to that state with two photon transitions. So there's off resonant transitions to a, to an intermediate state. Uh, both of those contribute. The one the one everybody should probably worry about more is that Rydberg state uh, lifetime. Uh, there are plenty of tricks uh, to play in, in the future. There are also long-lived uh, Rydberg states as well, um, so-called circular Rydberg states. So, you know, I think that's going to be always part of the design of the machine. It's, it's going to be something that, that we think about. Uh, we're always going to need bigger, better lasers to get farther off, off resonance with that intermediate state. Uh, and I, I think we're always going to be choosing new Rydberg states to work with just to, to maximize that lifetime. Okay, anybody else on the 10-year question? Um, 
you've been a very lovely panel. I think we're already encroaching on our uh, our break time. Hey, um, uh, John, there's one more question in the in the in the chat. Um, oh, sorry. I think Ilana uh, Vespi from Oxford Quantum Circuits asks, "How do you see the role of government for the quantum industry development? What helps? What doesn't?" I'll maybe weigh in very briefly from the Honeywell side. I think one thing we that does not help is a lot of restriction. Um, you know, certainly the US government's been considering export restrictions and ITAR restrictions and so forth. And um, you know, we, we've been kind of working through our government relations side to, to argue for you know, keeping things open as much as possible because we think there's just so much, so much innovation that needs to happen. Um, and it, it would just be too early to shut all that down. So from our perspective, we really think it's important to, to keep a, a free-flowing collaborative environment. So I can add, I, I agree completely with that. I see three things. The government should keep doing r and I think this is fundamentally important. I'd love to see more put into algorithm work. I would say secondly, um, I very much want to see um, the government taking a role in acquiring what I would call, uh, without lack of a better word, commercial grade systems. It helps industry keep going. And then the third, obviously, is um, the workforce development, which you touched on. And if the government can help us as a community address all three of them, as well as export, I think that would be very good for industry. Yeah, I'll give, uh, I'll give one positive, one negative. The positive is uh, government as customer is an extremely powerful concept. Uh, when I was working in DOD, this was something that we saw uh, spawn very valuable young companies uh, just by you know, DARPA buying technology and then it becoming acquisition through other services. On the negative, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about government becoming, uh, you know, shifting away from funding basic science and moving to create uh, what you can pejoratively call grantrepreneurs, uh, commercial organizations that exist for no reason other than to apply for government grants. I don't think that's a successful outcome um, for the industry. I think we can keep that in, in the university and national lab sector and instead let you know, commercial organizations uh, bloom in the private sector. Well, there's a related question, which is what's the role of academic researchers um, as investment pours into uh, both industry and, uh, and national labs, um, we're still going to need a lot of innovations. Do you see uh, you know, the university, of course, they're going to be providing the workforce that you guys are hungry for, but I, you're not going to come up with all the ideas yourselves, are you? Thank you. Uh, that was the first question you asked me, John. I think them doing high risk, high reward is essential for us to make progress. Yeah, I'd underscore that. Very good. Well, Great. I'm glad to, uh, to see uh, everyone is optimistic about the future. And uh, this was really interesting. I wish we had more time. But uh, we'll, we'll have a panel of fresh faces uh, later in the day. And I guess now it's, uh, it's network time. Is that right, Humesh? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks a lot uh, to the panel. And especially thanks to you, John, for uh, a really stimulating set of questions. Uh, so, so I believe Kelani has put the GatherTown link in, in the chat in case you missed it. So um, yeah, let's, um, let's meet up there and then, and then we'll meet back here at uh, 11.30. Thanks everyone. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. So yes, we invite you to go to Gather Town, which uh, is 